For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Hello from Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church in Kelowna, British Columbia, on this fourth Sunday in Lent, 2021. March 11th this past week marked the one-year anniversary of the WHO declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic. One year ago, pandemic swept across the globe. Little could we have imagined what would change, how fast it would change, how strange it would feel, and just how long it would go on. One year on, it seems important to pause, to give space to notice not only where we have come from, but where we are and where we are going. Where were we then, we might ask ourselves. Interestingly, looking back, I had flown to Calgary for a mini plant-based food conference on the morning of the 11th, or on the 10th of March. That was to feature Dr. Michael Greger, author of the book, How Not to Die, among others. He had canceled in the last minute as he was not feeling well and did not want to make the flight from the US. He also happened to have authored a book about a potential worldwide flu pandemic in 2007, so his deeper knowledge of the issue no doubt contributed to his decision to cancel. The conference went ahead with a few other equally engaging speakers, and then the next morning on the 12th of March I flew home. Our daughter happened to fly home from Mexico on that same day as well, later on and we joked when we picked her up about quarantines and restrictions. Little did we realize what lay ahead, as in the next morning, we got a phone call, yes, quarantine for two weeks, and on and on it went. Little did we realize that that flight would be the last time we would fly anywhere for over a year. Looking back, it reminds me of the stories of the outbreak of World War I, where young, enthusiastic soldiers kissed their mothers and girlfriends goodbye, promising that it would all be over by Christmas. Little did they know that they would endure four very harsh and muddy Christmases, and then some, before bedraggled survivors finally made their way home. One year ago, we gathered together to worship and pray on the Sunday after that declaration. We gathered vaguely aware of the changes and fears happening around us. We gathered as carefully as we could, clinging to our usual ways of being together, ignorant of the rapidity of change, ignorant of the fragility of our lives. Here at Christ Lutheran, we had a baptism schedule for that Sunday, March 15th. After much debate and consideration, we went ahead with caution and trepidation, and there were many members who chose not to attend because they were not sure about how to take the instructions. It all went well, and we were very relieved when there were no incidences of infection or illness, but that was when the lockdown began, and it was a very long time before we opened our doors again. Today, one year later, much older and perhaps wiser, and appreciative of how our community has supported us, we continue in faith, day to day. It's interesting that this anniversary happens to fall in the week of Lent 4. Lent has six Sundays, so this is kind of a break point in Lent. In times when Lenten restrictions and Lenten practices were much more strict, the fourth Sunday in Lent was seen as a Sunday of celebration to break one's fast and to re-prepare for those final couple of weeks and Holy Week and Easter. So Lent 4 gives you a kind of a breather on the way to Gethsemane, Golgotha, and Easter. And in our world, this time gives us a breather as where are we now with COVID and where are we going? This coming week happens to also have the March 17th, St. Patrick's Day in the civic calendar. But here at Christ Lutheran, an interesting day as it's our 72nd anniversary as a congregation. March 17th, 1949, a small group of faithful Lutherans here in Kelowna founded this congregation and we continue to give prayers of thanks for their vision their persistence their hard work and the many generations that have followed since then to keep our congregation an active thriving worshiping and caring community 
So however you choose to spend this Wednesday, stay safe, but take some time to acknowledge that contribution and perhaps to celebrate in your own way. This week is also a time of tentative good news on the day-to-day -day front. Our Medical Officer of Health here in BC, Dr. Bonnie Ann Henry, has indicated that with the high risk vaccinations happening soon and the vaccinations consistently rolling out, she is giving consideration to easing restrictions for houses of worship. We're not sure yet when, when the official date will come down, but our Easter season will be a very special time of resurrection this year. Keep checking our website for updates. Once we are back in-house, we will continue to film the services for those of you at home who are not able to join us in person for any number of reasons. But until we are in-house, we continue as we have been, and we focus on our worship for this day. As you know, we alternate between German and English Sundays. Our main service is a German service this Sunday, and so we have a briefer English service for you to appreciate and to enjoy. The focus of this Sunday, again, from our Sundays and Seasons prepare, preparation material, says as follows. The fourth of the Old Testament promises provide a baptismal lens this Lent as the promise that God makes to Moses. Those who look on the bronze serpent will live. In today's Gospel, Jesus says he will be lifted up on the cross like the serpent so that those who look on him in faith will live. When we receive the sign of the cross in baptism, that cross becomes the sign we can look on in faith. We can look on that cross for healing, for restored relationship to God, for hope when we are dying. And so as we commemorate this one year time, as we begin our fourth Sunday in Lent, as we look with renewed energy and focus to the remainder of Lent, the coming of Holy Week, and Easter peaking on the horizon. Let us pause and pray. We pause to name our losses and griefs. We pause to acknowledge our anger our fatigue, our frustration, and our fear. We pause to remember what is missing, what has been altered, the things we long for. We pause to name those lessons we have learned, the new skills, values, and abilities that have come with adaptability. We pause to look around, to be reminded of what is most precious, the values that we have recovered, the spaces we have found anew, the reminders of what really matters most in life. We are reminded how far we have come by faith alone, how far we have come with one another. Through our tired trudging and our cheeks stamped with tears, we catch a glimpse of your presence, your love, your hope. And so we pause to catch our breath, to rest a moment before continuing the journey. Let us pray. Gracious God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. So guide us that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Guide and strengthen our steps as we lean upon you. As we walk through the valley, lift our eyes to the mountain. Unite us, connect us, strengthen us and guide our footsteps, we pray. Amen. We give thanks 
to the worship source book for that prayer. And we continue with opening our hearts and our minds to God's and our spirits, to God's words for us on this day. Amen. First lesson. Biblical scholars continue to be uncertain about why this story was remembered as important enough to record in Numbers. At best, it seems to be a Christian metaphorical story about Jesus as a healer. The bronze serpent on a pole has become a symbol for medical healing in our time. During Lent, it draws attention to the need for wholeness in our society. Here is the story. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word. Second lesson. The writer to the Ephesians used words that became very much the heart of Luther's Reformation, his discovery that it was by grace through faith that we are acceptable to God, and not by good works changed the church of his day. Today it is still the heart of Lutheranism. The author writes, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love for which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Jesus spoke, and just as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The good news of Jesus Christ.
Does this look familiar? In the days when we could go to sports events or even watch them on television and you'd see all the crowds in the stands, you would see a number of placards with this, like this, or John 3.16 on them. Interestingly, I haven't noticed as much of late, mind you, we haven't seen many sports, so maybe it has gone its wayside, but John 3.16 is a verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. This verse is often quoted by enthusiastic Christians and in particular those who might identify, self-identify as born again and they display it on placards as a testimony to their faith, perhaps as a conversation starter, a way of converting others to the faith. We might shake our heads or be uncomfortable with such behavior, and as I say, I've noticed less of it, although it'd be interesting to see once COVID restrictions are lifted, we'll see what the crowds are like and if people are gonna be even more enthusiastic to bring their placards. Nonetheless, in essence, they are right. Martin Luther named this verse the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. For God so loved who the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. God created the world and created people and life carried on and that relationship was damaged, that relationship broke down, God sent prophets, people weren't listening. So God continued to love the world despite all the darkness and chaos in the world. God sent God's son so that the world might repair its relationship, come to know God in a new way. So humanity became estranged. God sent Jesus to rebuild that relationship. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. It does not end there, however. In that particular text, Jesus goes on to say, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we have this vision of a vengeful, angry, judging God, and this vision is transformed by this image of the Son coming not to condemn, not to be harsh, but to rescue the world, to save the world. We think of the chaos in our world. In the first lesson, we join the Israelites in their journey through the desert on the way to the promised land. They are not happy and in fact are complaining bitterly. Ironic in a way because for generations they were slaves in Egypt under the harshest of conditions. But now, partway through their journey, all seems forgotten in the here and now. Water is scarce. They don't like the taste of the food. They are angry at Moses. Why did you bring us here? What? What, uh, what are we here for? I wish we were back in Egypt where things were better. Of course they weren't better, but they've forgotten that. And so into that, into that chaos, God speaks, and, and there God sends serpents to teach the people a lesson. And so they all get bitten by these serpents, and then God repents and says, put one of the serpents on a pole, tell the people to look at the pole, and they will live. So another chaos in the, or another tragedy in the Old Testament or in the journey is averted. But how very typically human is that of the Israelites? How often, no matter how well things are going, do we find reason to complain or criticize or grumble? Or no matter how much we have, do we want more or complain about the quality of what we do have? Human nature so very clearly expressed in this one particular text. The second lesson in the Gospel we refer further into this theme. In the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. And then in the Gospel of John, for all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. These verses underline what we already know. That is, fundamentally, our envy, our greed, our egoism, our apathy, our self-serving continue to get in the way 
of the generosity that we are called to by God. We are here not just because of ourselves, but we are called to take care of the world in which we live, to take care of each other in that world. In many ways, we don't have control over our lives, even physically. In relation to the large proportion of the world's population, we live very well here in Canada. But still, people get sick, people have accidents, people die. It's part of being human. Lives go sideways, people lose their jobs. And all of us, the world over, have had to contend with our lives being taken over by a nasty, persistent virus that will not let go, and even with vaccines, still hangs about and keeps mutating into something else. It is so easily easy to feel that life is lurching from crisis to crisis, trying to make sense in the chaos. Where do we go in that turmoil? Walter Brueggemann, a Presbyterian minister and professor in the U.S., speaks to this so eloquently. He's an Old Testament scholar and with a particular focus on the Psalms and talks about how the world of the Old Testament was a time of chaos, of unrest, political intrigue, all of the many unsettled things that we love in our world today. And so he says that the words of Scripture are given to us to put voice to the lament the frustration, the anger we might be feeling. In, in particular in the Psalms, how many times in the Psalms do we hear the deep gut-wrenching feelings of the psalmist saying, how long, O God, O God, or how long, or my food has been, tear tears have been my food all noon and, and day and night. You know, in so many other places in the scriptures, or in the Psalms in particular, people are lamenting. And Brueggemann says this is done for a purpose and this is needed because if in the faith community we cannot express the hard feelings, the hard realities, the tough places we are in, where can then we? We live in a world that is so much about appearances and, and showing the, the, the best of ourselves but always like not revealing any of the struggles or any of the difficulties. And so Brueggemann says the scriptures and the Christian community are places where we can find voice to those feelings and to air them. Because if we don't air them, Brueggemann contends, they get bottled up and come out in other ways, in microaggressions and many other unhealthy ways of expressing those emotions. Once we have named the challenge, named the burden, named the hurt, we can then begin to address ways of healing it and coming to wholeness once again. Because it is fundamentally, ultimately, God's desire to bring light into the darkness of our hearts, our lives, our world, transforming our sin and our doubt into healing, forgiveness, and love. With God, the door is always open. Each day brings a new beginning. For as Paul reminds us in the same text of Ephesians, where at first he is chastising, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So we don't achieve our salvation. It has been given to us by Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, death on the cross and his resurrection. By grace we have been saved. It's because God so loved the world that we have been saved. It's not something we have been able to earn through our own doings. So he says, not the result of work so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So God created us to be loving and caring and doing people in the world. So Jesus breaks into the chaos of our fear, our loneliness, our yearning, in the form of the word, worship, holy communion, and in the presence of other people. Jesus comes to us in all these ways to embrace our lostness, our needing love, to reassure, reassure us that yes, we are loved, redeemed, cherished by God, and called into ever new relationship. So let us hear God's call into relationship and his offering of grace and forgiveness through the Son, who is the way and the truth and the life, so that we too may stand up again in faith, hope, and love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And that is most definitely good news. Amen.